Other Christians will betray you in the end times. How you can be ready? I guess we have to ask this question. Where do we get the idea that other Christians are going to betray us in the end times? You know, I think, and this channel believes that Christians have it all wrong. They think their church will be a sanctuary during the end times. A place they can depend on to protect them. You know, I've heard Jesus builds his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Or at least so they think, the verse says. Well, in many cases, that's going to be proved wrong. It's the people sitting next to you in the pews who will betray you in the end times and have you killed. Churchgoers will be the ones who turn us in. Church is going to prove to be a dangerous place. So how can we prepare for all of that while still attending church and participating in ministry? That's what we're answering today and we're starting right now. And no less a voice of authority than Jesus himself tells us this shocking fact. Most of us think the end times are about running from the Antichrist and his pagan forces. But the Bible tells us that in the end, it will be those professing Jesus that turn us into the Antichrist. Look what Jesus says. They will put you out of the assemblies. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think that he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Jesus is pretty clear that a day is coming when his followers would be put out of the assemblies they were attending, and when whoever killed them would think it was a righteous thing. Also, it says these churchgoers are fake believers, that they don't truly know Jesus or the Father. Now, in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus said essentially the same thing. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. This clearly marks the coming betrayal as being an end time thing. Notice this happens in all nations. So don't think if you live in a Western nation, you're safe. You aren't. And I think we're seeing some of that today. The riots in Australia, the mandates in nations like the USA and Europe, your religious rights are dissolving right before your eyes. Who will these betrayers be? And why will they betray us? Let's start with who they are. I mean, if you knew that it was the Joneses down the street, that they were the ones, you could avoid them, right? Well, Jesus knew all about betrayal. Judas is the model of someone within the church who betrays the Lord. And betraying true believers is betraying the Lord, after all, because whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you do unto me. But before we discuss how we can identify the betrayers, let me give a brief shout out to Britt Ashley and Michael Tarrant from our board of advisors who discussed this topic and gave me the idea for this video. Now back to identifying the betrayers. The first thing to notice about Judas, the model betrayer, is that other members of the church, the other disciples, were completely unaware Judas was the one. When Jesus dropped the bomb that one of the twelve would betray him, look at their reactions. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. So the betrayer will likely be invisible to other members of the church right now. They will look like everyone else for the most part. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. Think about what Judas saw and accomplished. He heard all of Jesus' sermons, saw all his miracles, and went on some mission trips of his own when Jesus sent the disciples out two by two. Jesus commanded them to cast out demons, heal the sick, and even raise the dead. So it's likely Judas participated in all those kind of things. I've always thought Jesus was looking straight at Judas 
when he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So the bottom line about who the betrayers will be is that we don't know. Judas was in the heart of the early church. He was a leader and someone who accomplished great things. In your church, the betrayers could be elders, even your pastor, those that took you on a mission trip, or even the missionaries themselves. But there were hints about Judas's spiritual condition if the disciples had looked just a little closer. Judas loved material things, money, and the world. The week before Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey, there was an event that defined the hearts of Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and Judas. We're quoting from John 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus has raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was the one who was reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the money box he used to pipher what was put into it. Notice John didn't say Judas acted like a thief. He said he was a thief. It was his heart condition. In the parable of the sower, Jesus tells us of two groups of churchgoers who will fall away. Two character traits, two heart conditions that identify those that are not truly saved. Let's look at that. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. The first thing to notice is that these people receive the word of God with joy. These are people who sit in the pews and profess a belief in Jesus. They profess Jesus, but they don't trust Jesus. They have belief, but not faith. So if you think your church has nothing but solid, sold out Christians in it, I think again. Jesus says they have this joy until they face adversity or tribulation because the belief that they have is shallow. They can't endure the persecution, and so they fall away. The second group is like Judas. They love the things of this world more than Jesus. My assumption is both of these groups are found in most churches on earth. And in many ways, a lot of pastors are promoting these ideas. Yes, think about what I just said. They're promoting them. The prosperity gospel churches that promote your best life now, that faith leads to wealth, are growing a crop of believers that love the things of this world. Ask yourself if your church is that type of church. Even if it isn't a prosperity gospel church, are they more about money than they are about the gospel? Are their meetings more about budget than about souls? The other type of churches are those that promote fear of the end times, a fear of persecution and martyrdom. I have heard famous preachers say if they didn't know they were going in the rapture, they might commit suicide. Yes, I actually heard that from well-known, world-famous pastors. 
Well, guess what? We don't know with certainty we are going to avoid persecution and martyrdom. In fact, Jesus said being persecuted was a mark of being a true believer. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember, Remember the word that I said to you? A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If you are attending a church that is promoting an escapist mindset, they are growing a crop of those who don't have deep roots. A crop of those who Jesus tells us will fall away when the hard times begin. They are the kind of people who will betray you. Now, this doesn't mean that only pre-wrath or post-trib rapture believers will not fall away. That is not what I'm saying. Please get that right. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that those who believe in a rapture position because they think it is a means of escaping the hard times, because they are afraid of the coming days of trouble, those are the ones who may have shallow roots. They are the ones who may be betrayers in the end times. And many churches are growing a whole crop of these believers because they aren't teaching about persecution and how to overcome it. They are growing a crop of those who will fall away. They're growing a crop of tares. Jesus all but said this directly. Let's return to John 15 and 16 and look at it again. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. So Jesus explains about persecution, testimony, and the Holy Spirit. And then says he spoke this so his followers would not fall away. He spoke this as a preventative measure. So our churches should be teaching us to expect persecution, should be teaching us to testify to the lost and to listen to the Holy Spirit. These three things Jesus said will help us prevent falling away. Again, ask yourself if your church is doing all three. Jesus reinforced this with a parable, the parable of the ten virgins. All were virgins trying to keep themselves pure. All were anxiously awaiting the return of the bridegroom. In today's world, all ten would be sitting in the pews attending church. But only five of the ten go with Jesus in the rapture. Five of them fall away. Let's look at exactly why they fall away. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. This is the current situation in the church. Jesus tells us 50% of the virgins don't have oil or the Holy Spirit. And since it has been 2,000 years since Jesus walked the earth, all ten have fallen asleep. In other words, they aren't actively watching for his return. But then something happens. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some oil, our lamps are going out. An announcement is made that the bridegroom is coming. And after this, all ten light their lamps. But the return takes a while. It's not immediate. And the oil already in the lamp doesn't last. And those without extra oil have their lamps burn out. They then go and try to buy oil. But while they are gone, Jesus returns and they miss the rapture. What does this mean? What are the lamps? The Greek word actually isn't lamp. It's lampus, which means torch. So these are bright, shining torches. It's the same word as the torches that Gideon's 300 men hid under jars and that they broke and scared off the Midianites back in the book of Judges. 
It is the testimony of a believer in word and deed. And only the Holy Spirit can keep it burning during a time of persecution. The foolish virgins don't have the Holy Spirit and can't keep their testimony burning after the announcement. So what is this announcement? Many, if not most, think it's the shout that Jesus gives as he descends from heaven in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. But think about it. It doesn't make any sense for it to be that shout. How would anyone have time to begin testifying at that point? Have time to have their lamps burn out and then have time to go and try to obtain the oil of the Spirit through buying it, all in the time after the descent of the Lord? That makes no sense. I mean, once Jesus appears in the sky, it's game over. No, the announcement is the moment we know that the end times have truly begun. Jesus told us what this announcement was just one chapter earlier in Matthew 24. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. It is the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist sits on the holy place and declares himself God. That is the announcement that the final 1260 days have begun. Days that Jesus told us would be the most difficult for believers in human history. That difficulty is why the foolish virgin's lamps go out. Let me say that again. That is why the foolish virgin's lamps go out. The difficulty of those days. These believers, these foolish virgins, are the same as the seed planted in rocky soil. They don't have a deep root. They are the same ones grown and nurtured in many of our churches. And when they see the abomination of desolation happen, and they realize they will be facing the Antichrist, they panic. And to protect themselves, they go along with the Antichrist system. Not only that, but they're willing to betray those who stay faithful to Jesus. So knowing this, what should Christians do? I think you should seriously question if you should be sitting in a church that either promotes the worldly system or promotes an escapist mentality. As we indicated, these churches are growing crops, grown in weedy soil and rocky soil, according to the Lord. But before you leave a church like that, share this video with your pastor. Ask him to consider what is being done. Maybe he will repent. Many of you are aware that when asked whether you should leave a church or not, I've always advised you to stick it out, to try to change the church, but never allow the church to change you. But I think as we approach the end times, you're going to have to make a decision about that. At what point are you going to bail out on a church that is just full of those growing in rocky soil? The second thing is to attend to the three things Jesus said help prevent anyone from falling away. This is something for you and your family personally. Mentally preparing for persecution, testifying about Jesus, and growing your relationship with the Holy Spirit through Bible study and prayer. Where would you start? What prophecy did Jesus indicate was the most important prophecy to know and understand? Click right here to keep watching and see what prophecy that is and why Jesus commanded us to study it. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.